Good morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you said that whenever two or three are gathered in your name, you are there uh, with them. And so we thank you that you are here, and we purpose to open our hearts and our minds to receive all that you want to give us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is time for announcements, and I have two this morning. First of all, today is the deadline for uh, the May newsletter, and then also uh, John Fulton, the moderator of the Deacon Board, and myself uh, met this uh, past Thursday to discuss the church's COVID-19 precautions, and a survey is on this topic is going to be distributed to the congregation this week. And then the survey will be shared through the monthly newsletter and other channels. And so in the meantime, if you have any questions or thoughts, uh, share these with John or a member of the deacon board. Any other announcements from the congregation this morning? Yes, Natalie. They got a mic right there. I know it's in the newsletter or in the bulletin, but uh, any graduates from last year or this year, high school or graduate, please let Larry or I know. We're going to honor them on May 16th, so I uh, want to make sure we get um, our gifts ready in time and know the number. So if you can just give us a shout out, that'd be great. Yes, sir. The uh, Cast Town Fire Department. Uh, Though we've been hurt by COVID with our social activities over the last year or so, uh, we are going to do a chicken barbecue. It's going to be Sunday, May 2nd, 11 to 2, drive through only. Uh, we're not allowing people to come in and congregate. Uh, it's first come, first serve. It's typical chicken dinners that we have, half chicken, uh, coleslaw, applesauce, dinner roll and chips, and... Uh, you know, it'd be great to see a super parade from here to the fire station on May 2nd. So if anybody uh, wants chicken, please stop in. Any other announcements this morning? If not, please stand for our first hymn, uh, Victory in Jesus.
seated. Well, I'm very excited, Tom, if you want to come. Tom Bailey. So uh, we are welcoming uh, Tom Bailey as a new member today, and I would encourage anyone who is uh, thinking about membership to really be prayerful about that. Being a member of Coast Spring Church just really means that you've committed that this is where you believe that God has planted you to be, and you're going to join with us in, in what God is doing here. And so if you are interested in becoming a member, um, just come to me. And we'll work that out. So Tom came to me and I had a great time talking with him this week. And he is ready to, to jump in and to serve and to, and to be a part. And did you want to say anything, Tom, or just let me do the talk? <laughs> so he's, he has been involved in church life for a long time. And so in, in this case, this is just a reaffirmation of his faith is how he is uh, joining. Because we recognize uh, the walk that he's had with the Lord and other churches he's been a part of and so really that's it Tom we're just welcoming you here's your certificate and the congregation is, is going to say this um, as we express our support to you and so Tom Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it is time for sharing joys and concerns, and I have a few this morning. Uh, first of all, Ann Horner has surgery on Tuesday, and we're going to be praying uh, for her. And then um, just got word, uh, Patty Tainer should be dismissed today. They're just waiting on one test result. Am I right? On that several tests but she's going to be released and going home today so we're thankful uh, for that and then we've been praying for Emma Hildebrand as some may know a uh, Tammy and Joe Cron that's their granddaughter um, she is in need of a stronger dose of chemo so we really need to uh, continue to lift up Emma during this time and then, are there any other joys or concerns from the congregation this morning? Yes, Judy. Your husband says you have something here. But we're just happy you're here. Okay, we're just happy you're back. Yeah. Amen. I have a joy, and it's great to hear Barb Fulton back on that organ again. <laughs> anyone else this morning? If not, let's bring these before the Lord as the body of Christ. Father, we lift up uh, Anne before you with her surgery on Tuesday. Just, just pray that you would give her great peace as she goes into surgery. Just pray that everything would work out uh, according uh, to the best hopes of the doctors. Uh, continue to lift up uh, Patty Tainer to you, uh, God. Just pray that her uh, recovery at home would go well. Continue to lift up Emma Hildebrand before you, God, that you would just move in this situation. Give her strength as she endures uh, this trial. Thank you so much, God, that Judy is back and here uh, with us. And we also thank you for uh, Barb on the organ again and what a blessing she is to us as she leads us in worship. Now let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, our Father. Time for the praise band.
I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down. Let's go down, come on down, come on brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the sorry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, fathers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, fathers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord. There is junior church available for children of all ages, and they can be dismissed at this time. So this morning, I'm excited because we're continuing our, our series on the mission of God, and I just want to uh, imagine for a moment uh, what our world is going to be like if the church in this moment of history in our generation says yes to the call of God and advances the mission of God. It's up to us whether or not we will say yes. You know, there's a lot of young people in our world today who lack purpose uh, too many of them get to the place where they feel like life isn't worth living anymore. There's too many uh, families in our country today that are on the verge of breaking apart. There's a lot of people in our world today that are about to face the trial of their life, and they do not have the faith that will get them through it. There are a lot of people in this world today that are far from Christ and do not know the hope and the peace that come from knowing Him. If we as the church, will advance the mission 
of God in the world. Things will be different. Not going to be perfect. They're not going to be perfect until Jesus comes again in power. But they will be different. Youth that did not have a purpose will find a purpose. Families that would have broken apart will stay together. People who are far from Christ will be brought near to him. It's up to us. We are going to leave this world in a certain way to the next generation. And if we will advance the mission of God in our time, we'll leave it in the best possible shape. God is looking at us in this moment if we'll say yes to advance his mission in the world. And so I just want to recap again what the mission of God is. This is the one and only mission that our Lord has given to us. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the mission of God, that all people would bring all of their lives under the lordship of Christ. And when that happens, all of the problems that our world faces will be solved. Okay? So this is the mission of God. This is why you are here on this earth. Whatever your particular role or place in society is, it's secondary to the part that God has called you to play in the great mission of God. And so today, we're going to talk about a very simple, obvious way, something that we can all do to advance the mission of God that I feel is far too often overlooked and neglected by the church, and that's simply this, to pray that the mission of God would be advanced in the world. The mission of God rises and falls on our prayers. Will we pray that God's mission is advanced in the world? And so the first thing that I want to talk about is that we need to pray that spiritual blinders would be taken off of the eyes of those that do not believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3 says, But even if our gospel is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only to those who are perishing. Among them, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving to prevent them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We've talked about this a lot before, but it bears repeating. We live in a universe where there is more than the physical realm, more than what we can see with our eyes or hear with our ears. There is a spiritual realm. It's the unseen real, okay? And in the unseen realm, there are the powers of darkness that do what? They seek to blind the minds of those that do not believe so they can't see the glory of Christ. And so I need a volunteer, and it'd probably be better for a guy because it might mess up a lady's hair. Dan already jumped up. So he's like, where is Dan? There, so I'm not going to pick on him. Is it, do we have anybody who would do this? Sometimes I wish we had youth, but they went downstairs. You can mess up my hair. <sighs> can you believe this? Yeah. Can you blindfold yourself, Cam? Does oh, it work? Just it. hold it. I'll hold it. Okay. Kind of turn over here by my voice. Do you see Jesus, Cam? He's right there. He's stepping out of the tomb. He's in his glory. Do you see him? No. You don't? He's right there. I don't see him. You don't see him? I don't see do we him. see him? All right, you can take the blinder off. There he is. Okay, that's all we're going to do. <laughs> if it was a guy, I would have picked on him more. But. Don't you appreciate Kim for doing that? And so this is the reality. This is what's going on in the world. There's a lot of people that say, you know, I just... I, I don't see Christ. I don't see him at work. I don't see his glory. I don't see his worth. It's because they don't see him. It's not because he's not there. He is there. And their, their minds and their hearts have been blinded by Satan, the God of this world, and they can't see his glory. So what do we pray? We pray, God, take the blinders off of their eyes that they might see. This is what... Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 18 says, I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. 
And so a conversion, people coming to Christ, it's a spiritual thing. And what holds them back very often is those spiritual blinders that are on their eyes. You may have someone in your life and you've, you've thought about them and you've, you've tried to reach out to them in love and you've tried your best to share uh, the hope and the faith that you have in Christ. It, it, it feels like you're just talking to a wall and you're not getting anywhere. And you feel like there's nothing that I can do for this person that I care about. There is something that you can do. You can pray for them and continue to pray for them until they can see the glory of Christ. You know, I heard the story from John Dixon about a friend of his uh, by the name of Lucy. He said that Lucy found herself working at a workplace where she was surrounded by Christians. And she said these were committed Christians who, who really did their best to live their faith. And she says, I like this. I like working around these people. These are, these are compassionate people. They're understanding people. They work hard. They pitch in. They're just, they're just great to be. That's a great work environment. And some of them would express their faith in a natural way when it came up in conversation. And she said, I like what I'm hearing. I like what they're saying about Christ and the hope of the gospel. But I just can't believe it. I just can't believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died and, and rose again. I just, I just I can't buy it. I like what I'm hearing. I like what I'm seeing. I just can't believe it. And so this went on uh, for two years. And then Lucy uh, found herself in bed one night wondering about all of these things and what she had seen and what um, people had said to her. That very same night, one of her friends that cared about her said he has never had this happen before or since. He felt this strong compulsion to get out of bed and get on his hands and knees and to pray for Lucy. And that night, he prayed for her, that she would see. And that very night, as she was laying in bed, she said, this is what happened. She said, there's no, no other words to describe it, but it seemed like a blindfold was taken off of my eyes, and I could see that Jesus was real and the gospel was true. And so the first thing we do to, to pray to uh, advance the mission of God is we pray, God, take those spiritual blinders off of the eyes uh, of those that do not see. And then really, uh, this is in my notes, but as Christians, we still have ways that we're blinded to the glory and the greatness of Christ. There's more to Christ than any one of us have yet to see. And we continue to pray for ourselves and other Christians that we would see more fully just how glorious he really is. And then uh, another thing that we can do is we can pray for God-empowered preaching. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12 says, And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So one of the ways... Sometimes this is overemphasized in the church, but one of the ways the mission of God is advanced in the world is through God-empowered preaching. When God empowers pre preachers to preach the gospel, to open the hearts and the minds of people to the truth of God and to the greatness of life uh, in his kingdom. Not just, not just preaching, but God-empowered, Holy Spirit-empowered preaching does the job. And so some of the characteristics of God-empowered preaching, uh, you know, when there's God-empowered preaching, there's a sense of divine presence um, in the sanctuary. Uh, there's wisdom that's shared that's beyond what a mere human can say. People feel like, you know, their mail's being read, that things are applied to their lives. This is God-empowered preaching. You know, it reminds me of, of the pastor. He was shaking hands with people on, it wasn't me, but on the way out of church, and this little old lady said, you know, Pastor, that was a good sermon. And he said, thank you, but it was the Holy Spirit. And, he, and she said, it wasn't that good, Pastor. <laughs> we all know what she's talking about. We've heard good preaching. That was good preaching. We've heard that good preaching. And that good preaching, it's only when Holy Spirit does the work, okay? And so how, how does that good preaching happen anyways? How does this take place that the mission of God would be advanced where people walk into a church and they feel like, I've encountered God. Paul gives us insight here in Ephesians 6.19. This is something we can all pray. And pray also that God's revelation would be released through me 
Every time I preach the wonderful mystery of the hope-filled gospel, yes, pray that I may preach the wonderful news of God's kingdom with bold freedom at every opportunity. How does, how does Holy Spirit-empowered preaching happen? When the people of God pray. So preaching is actually the job of the whole church. The preacher prepares and the people pray. The people pray. If the people of God will pray, God says he'll empower the preaching and it will change the lives of people. And so let's get real. Not all preaching really grabs our attention. Not all preaching feels like an encounter with God. You know, it reminds me um, some stories I heard here. This came from Bud Brooks, a pastor in Kentucky. There was a, a lady who visited a church for the first time. Her name was Gladys Dunn. And so after the service, there was, you know, a guy she hadn't introduced herself to. And so she just turned around and she says, hi, I'm glad it's done. And he said, I'm glad it's done too. (laughs) I wasn't Holy Spirit empowered preaching. There was a pastor who came up there with a Band-Aid on his chin and he said, sorry, church. He goes, you know, I cut myself shaving. I was thinking about my sermon. And someone said from the back, well, next time... um, Cut the sermon and think about shaving. So there you go. There was a guy, you know, pastor had a problem with his mic, and he said, can you hear me in the back? And the guy said, I can, but I wouldn't mind trading places with someone who can't. And then a little old lady on the, on the way out of church, she said, Pastor, you know, every sermon you preach is better than the next one. It takes a little bit. Oh, okay. And then finally, this is my favorite. There was a, there was a pastor who... The day came, he announced, I've been transferred to another church. And he was known for being long-winded and boring and, and all of that. And he said, I feel like Jesus is the one who has led me on to this church. And so as soon as he was done, the song leader like Barb or somebody said, let's sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. So there you go. <laughs> so here's the challenge. If you're in a service... In the preaching, boring, and it's long-winded. It's not grabbing your attention. It's, we, could, we could criticize. We could say, oh, man, we could pray, right? Because this is the job of the whole church. God, come. You pray. You pray, you see. What would happen in, in the church in the U.S. at every time? You know, it, it, people were struggling through a Sunday morning. and said, let's pray. I'll never forget, I, I was here, and I, I was preaching and it was dead in the water. And I was about five minutes into it, and I was wanting to go more than you were. Let me tell you. I was like, geez, I can't quit at five minutes. How am I going to? It just was not connecting. I could tell. You know, people were counting the, the tile up there. How many knows how many there are? Is it 130? Somebody knows. Rick, Rick's got it. What is it? 239. 239. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God, this is bad. You know, what do I do? And then it was like I kind of recovered and I started connecting. People started, you know, listening. And it's like I felt like I had something to say. And how is this working? And this lady came to me. You know, I don't know. It was after church. It's been a while, a couple days later. She said, you know, when you were really struggling, she goes, I saw that. I prayed for you. So who changed the service? It was her. She prayed and God responded. And so we can advance the mission of God uh, when we pray. In this way, Charles Spurgeon was considered one of the greatest preachers of all time, preaching in the 1800s. He was called the the Prince of uh, Preachers. He preached to the largest crowd in in history up until that point, Um, uh, 23,654 people in 1857 at the Crystal Palace in London. That's still a big crowd today. And some ministry students came. They said, Spurgeon, what is the secret of your success? How is it? How is it that when you preach it, it's so life-transforming? And he was giving him a tour of his church before the service started. And he said, let's go in the basement. And he went in the basement, and there were like two or 300 faithful church members who had gathered together every Sunday to pray that God would come and touch the hearts of all those that came that day. He said, that's the secret of the success. Because if the people of God pray, God comes and he empowers them. And so this is my challenge that we would, we would pray for that. And then not just for our church. When, when you get a heart for the mission of God, 
It's so much bigger than just our church. I just looked up in Miami County, there's over 100 churches, okay? In this Sunday, there are going to be people walking into those churches that have just received the most devastating news of their life. They've walked out of a doctor's office this week, and they've gotten this diagnosis, and they are reeling. And they're coming to church because they need to hear a word from God. It's going to happen today in Miami County. There are families that are going to walk into church, and maybe the last time they're together because they are on the brink of falling apart, and they need God to come and, and, and bring forgiveness and bring them together. There are people who are searching, and they're going to give church one shot. Today's that day. And it's going to happen every day, every Sunday, some church in Miami County, in the regions around us. And so we pray for all of the churches and all the pastors. I, you know, I had a pastor before. He would preach. He would pray, and he said, and God help all the pastors who are preaching today because we're united with all Christians in the mission of God. And so this is a very small but practical thing that we can do. We pray that God's mission would be advanced in the church uh, through preaching. And then we uh, also pray that God's mission would be advanced through be- laborers being sent into the harvest field. This is Luke chapter 9 in verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest. There's probably no other text in all of the word of God that gives you Jesus' heart, heart for those that need God, than this text. Okay, I want you to notice, it says he was moved with compassion. Uh, When I learned uh, uh, the original Greek of the Bible, this is probably my favorite word, splanknizomai. Splank is a fun word to say. This is moved with compassion. The noun form is splanknon. It means intestines, viscera, entrails, bowels. He was moved within himself. It was this gut feeling. I just experienced that a few weeks ago. I had this good friend of mine. Um, I was there um, in Bible school where he met his wife, saw them fall in love. I was there at his wedding. So they had three kids and kind of lost a little, a little contact with him and found that he had sent me a message on, on Facebook that I hadn't seen. He says, you know that my wife and I, we've divorced. And I don't know if you've had this happen before, but it was a gut thing. Just, oh, God, what happened? It just affected me in here. That's what happened to Jesus. He saw the crowds without God, and he's, oh, God. This gut moved with compassion. Our spiritual formation isn't complete until that's how we feel about the crowds in this world that do not know God. And so that's the first thing. The second thing, he simply tells the disciples to pray. Pray that God will send laborers into the harvest field because if we will, he will. And so there is something we can do. We see the people that don't know him and we pray that God would send people uh, into their lives to share the good news uh, with them. And so this can happen in a couple ways. One Maybe you have an individual in your life, a family member, a friend, and they won't listen to you. You've tried to help them. They're just not, they're not listening. The reality is we may not be the best person to talk to somebody, but there may be somebody else that they'll relate to, that they'll open up their heart to. And so what we do, we say, God, you send the right people across their life. Orchestrate things that they'll run into this, and conversations will happen. You make it happen, God. I had a a, a mom that I knew that got a hold of this, and so she started praying for her son who wasn't walking with the Lord, and he finally figured out what was going on. He says, Mom, you need to stop praying this because every week there's like three or four people I'm working with or something. They start telling me this stuff. He goes, I know it's you praying. (laughs) Stop praying. I'm tired of hearing it. She says, I'm not going to stop. And just wherever he went, and you know what? It worked, and he's, he's in church now, okay? And so we pray, God, I can't get through to them, but there may be somebody that can. And so we pray that. And then we also pray, uh, as we're wrapping up here, that God would call people 
into vocational ministry, into, in, into uh, ministry and missions, to say yes to that call. You know, the uh, Christian Missionary Society in 1872, at its hardest year, hadn't had any candidates step forward to go on the mission field in, in years, and it was in dire straits financially, didn't have enough um, finances to keep it going. They have to start pulling missionaries off of the field because they didn't have the finances. And so instead of asking for money, they asked for prayer. And they convened a, a national day of prayer for the whole organization that God would move on the hearts of, of people to say yes to the call, to go on the mission field. And you know what? In, in a few months, they had more candidates step forward than they ever had before. And at the end of the year, they had the best budget that they'd ever had in the history of the organization. 150 years later, they're still going strong, 130 a missionary. So we pray that God will move on the hearts of people to say yes to that call to do his work in a vocational way. And then this is something that many of us will think is never, ever going to apply to us. But you may be surprised. It's going to apply to somebody here. We commit ourselves that we won't stand in the way of the call of God on somebody's life. So J.D. Greer, he tells a story of how he had his life planned out and his family was, was so happy and excited for him. He's doing really well in college and he was on track to go to law school and do well and just have a great, great life. And um, he felt the call of God to, uh, to go on the mission field. So he had, had this tough conversation with his mom. And he's, you know, he's at this restaurant, and he's like, Mom, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go to law school. And I feel like this is what God is doing. And I know that you probably had visions of me living really close to you, having a comfortable life, and raising grandkids where you could see them every day if you wanted. He says, but I'm going to be going to other countries, and I don't know how often I'll be home. And then he just waited, and she was really quiet. She said, J.D., she said, your dad and I prayed for you ever since you were small that you would do the will of God. And if this is what he wants for you, that's okay with me. And we have all of eternity, all of eternity, to enjoy the blessings of family together. And if we miss out on some of those now in this life, that's okay because you're going to help other people's sons and daughters know him. Isn't that good? And so we commit to sacrifice and to say, you know what? If there's someone in my life and you might be surprised, you think it would never be my kid or grandkid, you might be surprised who he calls because God has a way that's beyond our way. We say, God, I won't stand in the way. I'll support them in what you've called them to do. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you uh, that we get to be a part of your mission in the world. And as we do that, we get to enter into your heart how you feel about this world, how you uh, care about it. And, and we, we, we experience the life that you've designed us to live because we're, we're living in alignment with your mission and purpose for us. And so I pray that as a result of this message, we would all be more intentional about praying that the mission of God would be advanced, that, that some of us work with people that we think that person is so far from Christ and there's nothing that I could do, that we would change that mindset and say, I can pray for them. Because God can bring those that are the farthest away, the nearest to him. That family members maybe we have given up on, we would continue to pray for them, that God would send the right people so that they might know Christ. And I just thank you for uh, all the fruit that will come out of our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.
as you receive this blessing from God's word as you go. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Amen.